So I am excited and happy to welcome our keynote speaker. Uh, her name is Dr. Tia Martin, and she's the CEO and founder of All Access Inc. And she's the former Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Boston. So let me explain to you what that means. So the City of Boston was a part of this thing called 100 Resilient Cities. And 100 Resilient, that's still part of it, right? And they did this whole thing around climate change and how it would impact cities. And uh, Dr. Martin's proposal was around race and equity. Because as we all know, Boston historically suffers from issues around race and equity. And so her and I, in different capacities, worked together for two years. And um, so I'm happy to call her um, an ex-colleague, but also re my really good friend. So I'm really happy she's here today. So in August 2015, she was appointed by Mayor Walsh who to basically create a, um, a resilient strategy for the city of Boston. And her focus was really on working with Bostonians, sort of centering, I think she met with over like 100, like 11,000, 10,000 to 11,000 people from Boston to really create this strategy. And so this is basically what's written about it. It's basically to help Boston prepare for, withstand, and bounce back from the shocks catastrophic events like floods, infrastructure failure, and acts of terrorism, and stresses, slow-moving disasters like persistent racial and economic inequality, lack of affordable housing and unemployment, which are increasingly part of 21st century life. Boston's resilience building efforts place a unique focus on social resilience in a city affected by historic and persistent divisions of race and class. So happy to introduce my good friend, I want to do some ho housekeeping quickly, because if I don't do this, Sandy will yell at me. Um, if you want to let us know your thoughts and comments on this session, use the hashtag, hashtag nonprofit resilience, right? Here's my good friend, one of the loves of my life, it's Dr. Tia Martin. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So first of all, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. I've heard you have had a busy day and a half. Busy good, though, full of learning and relationship building and all of the wonderful things that help us to be more resilient, which to, is the topic of today. So I'm going to talk about resilience, how it relates to racial equity and other social injustices, and then to get more practical, and what does that mean for our organizations? What does it mean for our organizations? But also, what does it mean for the challenges that we face as people in organizations? And what does it mean for leadership? What does it mean for us as folks who are actually trying to do the work? All that said, I'm gonna stop using this handheld mic because I just remembered that I have a lapel mic and I just took the mic because John handed it to me. Can you still hear me? Oh, wonderful. OK. So racism. I'm going to jump right in. Right. Actually, before I jump right in, let me give you some, a, a couple of pieces of information about me that I think are helpful for context. So I was born and raised in Boston. Most people don't realize that because I don't have the Boston accent. So I apologize to disappoint you, but I, I was born and raised here. My husband and I have five children. Um, and we have spent most of our time as uh, husband and wife and as parents thinking about and developing strategies for what does it mean to raise five black children, three boys and two girls, in a society, in a world that's not designed for them to be successful. How do you protect them and buffer them from all that the world tells them in terms of the limitations for them, in terms of who they should be, how they should be, and the boundaries of the world for them. So that goes against our culture and how we try to raise our children. And so we had to do a lot of work to help build up the type of critical thinking skills, the types of consciousness, and the types of practical skills that they need in order to navigate in spite of that, which, is really, which really connects us back to resilience. And isn't that what we're all trying to do in our organizations? We're really trying to buffer ourselves from the external pressures of the world on us getting the work done, on us being effective in getting the work done. So 
But the reality is that people uh, are not perfect. I know that's a shock for some people. But we are not perfect. And sometimes, you know, we should always strive to be better, do better. But we are not perfect. And sometimes we forget that. We forget that we don't have all the answers. We forget that we need other people in order to get the work done. And we, we need to expand our networks in order to diversify our perspectives on what is actually happening, what's the state of things, and how we can move forward. So what I want to jump right in with is talking about racism. Most people are uncomfortable with that discussion, but I know I'm among friends here because many of you struggle with these issues in a very um, uh, proactive way in order to move the work forward. But I know there's always room for improvement, and if we're being honest with ourselves, then we're always looking for different strategies in order to move the work forward. And so that said, racism. So I know all of you know what it is, so I'm not gonna tell you what it is. We're gonna crowdsource it, is that okay? Okay, because I know we can do this because you all are brilliant. That's why you're in the roles that you're in. So, racism, what is it? And we, we don't have to be too formal here, just shout it out and I'll repeat it to make sure. Fear, Fear. thank you, that's an excellent component. What else, what is it? Judgment. Judgment. Systems. System. Lack of understanding. Lack of understanding, someone said over here, Resistance. What do you mean by resistance? Mm. Resistance to change, resistance to acceptance and inclusion. What else? Ignorance. And then what was over here? Ordinary. What do you mean by ordinary? It's embedded, right? So it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's omnipotent, it's all over the place. What else? Power, okay, that's a key word. What do we mean by power? Preservation power? Preservation of power. What is power? Control, privilege, what else? So I heard someone over here. Influence, yes. Resources. Access. And what was this? Hate. What else? And it seems monolithic. What do you mean by it seems monolithic? It's not. Right, so it seems like it's the norm in some places, but it's not. Divide and conquer, thank you. Anyone else? Systematic, yes, so it's systematic, it divides and conquers, it's about influence, privilege, and all the other things that folks said. So when we talk about power, in the context of racism and other forms of oppression, we usually don't really spend very much time on that as a key foundational component of what racism is. Racism is dehumanizing, right? In order to believe certain things about other people, you can't see them as like you, right? It's also historic, historical, rather, in that it's embedded all across our history in different ways all the way up till today. We talk about it in past tense sometimes. We don't mean to, but we do. But it's still alive and well today, breathing and in the air that we breathe. And so this idea around racism and how it actually impacts us. So number one, it's a system, right? It has a process, because all systems have a process. It's a tool that gets used to try to get us to do things that may not always be in our own best interest, whether we're people of color or we're white. And I wanna sit there for a moment because this idea of how racism hurts white people is something that we don't often talk about. And it's important to the framing because we can't see racism as charity for people of color because it's not charity for people of color. It's not about saving people of color. We can save ourselves. It, given the right tools, information, power, right? We have to see it as something that we have to save all of ourselves from, that it is a scourge that is impacting all of us. 
and I'm going to give you some concrete examples, and then I'm going to talk about resilience. So when we think about how racism hurts white people, there's this concept that I borrowed from some really smart people, uh, smart young people, called boomerang daggering yourself. Anyone heard that before? <laughs> boomerang daggering yourself. It's this idea that you throw out a weapon against somebody else, and you hit them, you hurt them, but it comes back around and it hurts you too. Boomerang daggering yourself. It's an important concept in understanding racism because it gets at how it's a tool that gets used and how it hurts white people too. So I'm gonna give you some concrete examples. My favorite one to use is the poll tax. What was the poll tax? You can't vote unless you pay for it. Now, let me ask you this question. Is voting exclusively about African Americans? Is it exclusively about white people? Is it exclusively about other people of color? But that's how we frame issues. We tend to take an issue and we paint it with the picture of a group so that we can, so that others can use it as a form of power to make us feel a certain way about issues. And voting is the same thing in this case. So the way it was framed was that African Americans, newly released from slavery, now you got the right to vote. But we knew that they didn't have any money because we didn't give them any. We knew that they didn't have any education because we didn't give them any. In fact, you couldn't even read. All you could know was what you needed to know in order to do what the slave masters needed you to do. So now they have the right to vote, and folks don't want them to vote. So you paint the narrative with, well, we don't want them to vote because they don't have enough information or education to be able to do this. So what can we do in order to prevent that from happening? Let's put a poll tax in, because we know they can't pay it. And we're going to sell that to everybody in society that this is what we're, this is what we're doing. We just, it's just that we don't want them to vote. So if you have to pay to vote, are African Americans at that time the only people who didn't have money? There were, and there were, and there still continue to be many poor and working class white people, right? And so if you think about the ripple effect of what it means for white people, and this is that they couldn't vote too if they didn't have the money. But no one thought about that as a consequence of the framing of the narrative. And afterwards, it's too late. And so without critical thinking skills to be able to really assess the narrative that is being given to us about different situations, we make decisions that hurt ourselves in addition to other people that we think we're preventing from getting access to things. I'll give you another example, the, op the opioid epidemic. Got some hunks in the room, okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little bit different framing. So if we go back to the 70s and 80s, when crack and heroin was first introduced to communities of color, which we know is not a conspiracy theory anymore, it was actually intentionally introduced into communities of color. It's documented by our own government. And then we said, that is criminal work, that those people, those people are destroying our cities and in in, in, in we need to do something about that. So we're going to criminalize it. Instead of seeing that substance, substance use disorders are not unique by race. We use different drugs, but the actual data shows us that it's about 50-50, generally speaking, give or take, depending on which period of time you look at. So we just use different drugs, except for marijuana. But for the most part, <laughs> we use different drugs. All that said, if you fast forward, then we go to the 90s, and then we got even more serious, and we had this war on drugs. In particular, we got really serious about it. And we really reinforced this, this school to prison pipeline. So to, su to such an extent that we have the highest number of people incarcerated in the world, and they're predominantly people of color. Now, had we saw that struggle that was happening in inner cities across this country 
as a shared struggle around substance use disorder, which we were all dealing with, then we would have seen it as a public health issue as we do today. And we would have invested in infrastructure to support people through that experience, through that disorder. But we didn't. And so today, we don't have the public health infrastructure to deal with the current narrative of what substance use disorder looks like today, which is we've painted it with the face of white people. And now it's a public health issue, and we're clamoring for resources that we could have had already. Boomerang daggered ourselves. So that's why that concept is so important. Now, the other thing is that racism, also in the context of power, has huge implications in society in terms of the types of power that play out across society and in our organizations. I'm only gonna talk about a few, but there are at least seven that we've pulled together um, at all ACEs in order to help work with clients to really kind of get practical and specific about what they're doing in their organizations. We talk about communication power. Who gets information? Who gets to contribute to information? Information they need to do their jobs, information just about what's happening in the organization. Decision making. Who gets to be a part of decision making? Who understands the process? Who's a part of the decision making process across the organization? Or is it, is it just a handful of people behind closed doors? Knowledge and expertise or experience. Whose knowledge and experience gets respected or acknowledged and is part of the narrative, whether it's in society or in the organization, in order to have a deeper pool of knowledge that allows us to make better decisions, that allows us to communicate better. Relationships and structure. Relationships are an incredibly powerful way that we perpetuate inequities in organizations without realizing that we're doing it. What we tend to do is we substitute systems and process and transparency with relationships, even for simple things. So when someone starts in an organization and they're trying to figure out how do I make sure I don't step in the stuff that are part of the norms and standards of the organization, well, if it's not written anywhere, and I don't mean the stuff that's written that we don't actually do, I mean actually written in terms of how we operate as an organization, in terms of our real values, the real ways that we're supposed to engage with each other or not. Instead, we say, oh, well, get with this person and they'll explain what you need to know. And if you don't have a relationship with that person, they're just gonna explain to you whatever it is, like is on the top of their head at the moment, and they're in a rush, and they're just trying to get to their next thing, and you're kind of in the way of them getting to their next thing, and they might even be nice about it, but that's the reality. And when you go deeper into the organization and you've been there for a while, and you don't have relationships, you don't understand how to get promoted, you don't understand what leadership is expecting, like what they are looking for in terms of being moving up in the organization, you don't understand what it means to actually accomplish the mission completely. So it, it presents a lot of challenges. And then we have lots of informal uh, activities that happen that are related to those relationships where a lot of those conversations around how we communicate and all these, how we make decisions and all of these different forms of power are actually being discussed. Golf for some people, card games in other organizations, folks go out after, after work and go to dinner and talk about these things, but it's usually a limited group of people. And if you're not part of that group, then you don't have the same context that they have, and they don't realize that everybody else doesn't have the same context that they have. And it becomes this status quo cycle of perpetuating inequities. And we know that status quo, when we continue to do what we've been doing, perpetuates inequities because we've built an entire set of systems and institutions on top of a foundation that started exclusive. It was intentionally exclusive. And we passed some laws and said, okay, we're done with that, it's all fixed now. But we never actually addressed the root problem, which is our culture as a society and in organizations, as well as us as people. 
and I hate to break it to you, but we are the system that we keep talking about. It is not a, you know, uh, Oz behind a curtain, there's the man. The system is us. We're the ones who walk through the doors of institutions and make policies, make programmatic decisions, make budgetary decisions that impact lots of people. So if we don't change ourselves, then we're not really doing the work. If we're not managing ourselves, then we're not really doing the work. And what do I mean by managing ourselves? So the process of racism is such that it is the perfect storm of neuroscience, how our brain is actually wired and how it works, psychology and how we behave and how we make decisions and why we do things, and sociology, the fact that we're in a society where we're engaging with other people interpersonally, we're engaging with ourselves across institutions. It's this perfect storm of things that collide together that impact how we actually think, which determines our behavior. Now, I'm gonna ask you another question. Are we born good thinkers? Born, are we born good thinkers? Could be, we develop it. Anyone else? Say that again. <laughs> so we can become smarter, but is it natural? Is that our default state of being? We're not rational at all. There used to be that whole idea that, you know, rational actors and behavioral economics, you know, we're rational and, you know, A plus B plus C. C equals D and all that other stuff, but it's not the reality. The reality is thinking is actually a skill that we have to develop. Our natural default state of being is actually messy, illogical, irrational. It's just messy, and we are emotional creatures. And then we take a bunch of irrational, messy creatures, and then we throw them all in an organization, and we say, go! Make it happen, right? And so without the skills to be able to say, you know what, let me take a step back. I'm feeling a certain way about this situation. Why do I feel a certain way about this situation? What is happening in this moment? Should I feel that way? What are my assumptions that are making me feel that way? And what additional information do I need in order to think and feel differently about this situation. Not just as an individual interacting with another person, but as we think about policy and practice, we have a lot of assumptions that are uncovered, that are not uncovered, that are hidden to us. And we don't realize how they're impacting how we behave, the way we make decisions as individuals. And then you bring us all together and then we have this collective unconsciousness and we go along with the societal pressures and forces that are telling us how people should be, what they should be doing, what we should expect from them, what they deserve, and we don't realize that we're doing it. So when people talk about unconscious bias, some people have been to some trainings, and you know, some of them are good, you know, and others you're like, eh, I knew all that stuff already. But did you walk away with tools to manage yourself? We need tools to manage ourselves. I'm going to share something with you by the wonderful Gil Noble. It's a throwback book. I'm a little older than I look. Been in my dead for a long time. So he's talking about his journey to consciousness and how he started out as an African American man who just saw himself as another American navigating the world, trying to make it in the television industry, television and radio industry, and how he encountered Malcolm X's speech, which he avoided Malcolm X like the plague, like the plague. He thought that guy was crazy. He said it. He was like, that dude's crazy. Something's wrong with him. I don't understand why he's so radical and so upset about everything. And he avoided him 
until Malcolm X passed away. And then he came into contact with a speech that Malcolm X did. And then he realized that the framing and the narrative that had been given in mass media was actually not accurate. And the more he learned, the more he wanted to learn. And this is him framing his experience. Except I just lost the page because I was talking, sorry. Here we go. As my knowledge in as my knowledge has increased, my ego has decreased proportionally. Knowledge is the mother of humility and makes one realize how little is really known overall. Some people have misused knowledge by studying how to perfect ways to enslave and dominate others. To overcome these people, one must be equipped with more and better knowledge. And I would add to that critical thinking skills. Because critical thinking as a field, as a practice, actually acknowledges that we're messy, naturally, by default, and that we need tools to manage that if we want to live in the type of world that we would like. The world as it is versus the world as we would like it to be. And so the world as it is is the messiness, and the world as we would like it to be is more socially just, recognizes each other's humanity in all situations, not just when it's convenient for us. And within organizations, this idea of critical thinking is important because it's also tools you need for everything else in your life. It's not just about addressing issues of equity or inequities, like racism. It's just a basic skill that we need. It makes us have better relationships. It makes us understand and process what's happening in the world better. It helps us see things from different perspectives. And so there's a whole series of skills that we never, that never get developed through traditional education systems that we need in order to not allow racism and other forms of repression to be used as a tool to get us to do things that are against our own benefit. That said, what in the world does it have to do with resilience? So racism has levels, right? There's levels to this, as the young people like to say from the battle rap culture. There's levels to this. The levels start with ourselves, though. We don't usually talk about it, but it starts with us, the intrapersonal side of things. What is it? How do I see myself in this world? How do I navigate the world? What is it that I believe strongly? Why do I believe what I believe so strongly? See, resilience is a, is a wonderful concept that's been around for a long time, despite the feeling that it's new in the way that we're using it. It's been around since the 70s in the context that we're using it in, in terms of academia, we've been talking about it since then. But this idea of resilience is amazing because it forces us to break down silos, to see the connections across a complicated world. It forces us to look at ourselves as individuals and as institutions to say, what is it that I'm faced with right now? How am I gonna prioritize so that I can focus on something? Because we can't do everything, because everything is, is related to resilience to our resilience, whether it's our individual resilience or our institutional resilience or our collective resilience? How do I plan in order to get from where I am to where I wanna be based on the priorities that I've set for myself? How do I monitor it continuously to make sure that I'm on track or maybe I need to address, uh, adjust the priorities that I've set for myself? It's also an acknowledgement that there's no difference between the chronic stuff that happens in our communities, as was described in the introduction, things like racism, things like income inequality, wealth, the wealth gap, education, um, access, all those types of things. It's also the chronic, or excuse me, the acute shocks. It's the big disaster stuff that we usually think of hurricanes, terrorism, but that there's no separation between the two. 
and that in fact, you can pretty much predict the outcome of most disasters because it's based on what's happening in communities right now, today. If the infrastructure is horrible, then when a disaster happens, you're gonna have infrastructure problems. If there's problems in the economy, when the disaster happens, you're gonna have huge economic problems because it's just gonna make it worse. If there are problems with the environment, you're gonna have environmental issues. And if there are problems with social justice, you're gonna have problems with marginalized people being disproportionately impacted by those disasters and suffering worse consequences, and it being further layered with the challenges of the institutions that then come in to bring services for that disaster. And the inequities that exist in those institutions because they're the same inequities that existed before the disaster. It's all predictable based on what's happening right now today in our communities. So as an organization, what does it mean for us? As organizations, we have to do the work, not just on policy, important, right, in, ter in terms of what we, the work we need to do. So we have to do that, because we need sophisticated strategies to match the complexity of the issues. We have to look at our practices and our culture. But we also have to give people and organizations tools to be the organization that we're trying to be to get to the place that we're trying to get to, and training is not enough. Training is helpful in the moment, but we know through research that if you forget most of what we learn and the further away from it you get, the less you remember. So if it's not institutionalized in the organization, it doesn't take effect. And what does it mean to institutionalize this practice? So I heard through the grapevine that you all have had discussions around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and yesterday you had some more presentations around those challenges, and a lot of the context around those conversations is human resources. That stuff that human resources does, right? How we hire people, how, how we recruit people, how we hire them, how we train them, how we promote them, what happens when people leave the organization? how they transition out of the organization, that whole spectrum. But it's also how we do the work itself. It's not enough to just look at diversity from as the objective. Diversity is not the objective. Equity is the objective. Diversity is a step on the road to being able to implement equitable practices, but it is not the end game because diversity without equity is oppression. You're basically taking a bunch of people who are already marginalized in society and you're grouping them together in an organization that does not have the culture or consciousness to see that diversity as a resource to be tapped into as a competitive advantage, which the data is very clear that it is. There's no more business case that needs to be made. It's been made over and over and over again. We're done with the business case for diversity. So the idea is, what do you do as an organization to be ready to receive the diversity? From a culture perspective, in terms of how power is distributed within the organization, in terms of how you're equipping the employees in the organization to receive that diversity. What usually happens is in an organization, we get some diversity, we're like, yes, we got some diversity, right? And then we, have, we take lots of pictures and we're like, diversity, get over here, come in the picture, <laughs> right? We have diversity. And that's the extent to which we value it in an organization. We, we create employee resource groups, we're like, you guys go talk to each other, get over there, right? But we don't say, I'm about to put together this project team, right? And we know usually when we put teams together, just like when we were kids and you're picking the players, you pick people that you already have relationships with. And remember what I said about relationships, they're the biggest way we perpetuate inequities. So you take that relationship, 
and you pick all the people that you have relationships with. And you're like, all right, you guys, you're my project team. Come on, we're gonna go do this project together. Now, as organizations grow and evolve, you bring on more staff, you add your diversity, but they can't get into that project team because they don't have a relationship with them. We've, in that case, is a concrete example how we've substituted good systems, good process for relationships. Because a good system and process is, hey, we actually have a toolkit that is mandatory that people use when they're putting together a project team. And it forces you to think about all the different types of diversity that you need for your project team. Starting with group identity diversity, right? Race, gender, class, all that stuff. But also, diversity in experiences. You need some new people on the team who haven't been completely indoctrinated into the old ways of the organization that we're trying to get away from. You need people who have different types of experience in terms of functions in the organization so that you have all those different perspectives on the team so that you're not stepping into stuff unnecessarily. That someone from budget or someone from who does community engagement can make sure that you don't step in. It's also diversity in terms of styles of doing things and approaches. Some of us are more aggressive. And we're like, yeah, we're gonna get in there, type A, and I'm just gonna do it, and go team go, right? And then we have other people who are more introverted. And it doesn't mean that they don't have social skills, it just means they process a little bit more, right? They need to internalize it before they're ready to put it out there for everyone. You need those people on the team too. So how do we give our employees tools to actually accomplish what we're trying to get them to do, which is work across diversity to actually achieve the mission of the organization? Because the other thing about all of these different forms of oppression is they're also distractions from what we're supposed to be doing. We waste a lot of time and resources on things that have nothing to do with the mission and that are about avoiding difference, that are about avoiding conflict, and about avoiding, avoiding, avoiding. Avoiding each other, even. Because what we also know about relationships is that they're very racially segregated, like at an extreme, exponential level. And I don't mean, hey, how's the kid? Good, yeah, oh yeah, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, okay, all right, good to see you, all right, have a good day. Not that kind of relationship. I mean, folks that you actually would tell what's really going on in your life to. Those relationships. Folks that you would invite over for dinner. Folks that you would go shopping with. Folks that you would do play dates with. Those kinds of relationships are incredibly racially segregated. In fact, research shows that for white people, it's about 90% exclusively white for their networks those close people, not the social networks, that it's 84% for African Americans. And I apologize to my Asian brothers and sisters, but the data wasn't enough to be able to make a conclusion about Asians. And I hate, and I, I, and I under, also understand the fact that it's a broad range of categories of people that doesn't make sense to all cluster them as Asian, but they didn't have the appropriate data. And for Latinos, it was 64%, keeping in mind that they also identify across the races. So we are incredibly racially segregated in our personal and professional relationships. So we need tools in order to force us to work together. We need skills in order to be able to use those tools. That's where training comes in, to help us understand why we're doing this and how to do it. And then we need the tools to remind us to get present in the moments where it matters most and to think critically about what it is that we are doing. To stay focused on the mission at hand so that we don't get distracted. So what are some other practical things related to resilience and racial equity? The other practical things are this idea of how we, we want to talk about communication. It's also about how we frame the narrative of things. Right, so I talked about narrative framing in terms of racism. How we 
understand what the current situation is, is uniquely dependent on our understanding of history. And we don't learn history in, 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 throughout our whole formal education. It's not the real history. We get the watered down American mythos version of history, the things we're comfortable with. But we don't get the full history, and without that context, we don't fully understand how we got to the inequities we see today, and therefore any strategies that we come up with to address inequities based on that limited framing of understanding of history, it will be woefully inadequate. So the New Deal, it's one of my favorite historical events, not because I enjoy what happened with it, but as an example. So does anyone know how the New Deal is framed when it's taught to kids? More jobs, created infrastructure, roads, interventions. What else? Programs, right? Because remember, this is after the Great Depression. Ending poverty. So the question, so I'll tell you how it's framed. Kids are taught that it is responsible for the American middle class. So who was the New Deal for, though? Did, all, did everyone have access to the New Deal? No. no, it was for white people. So it is true that it created Amer the American middle class. It created the American white middle class. That is not what we're learning, though. And if we don't understand that, then we don't understand why we see such huge inter intergenerational wealth gaps in communities of color. We, and, and this isn't even getting to slavery or Native Americans being put on reservations or any of that stuff. This is just one moment in history where we gave out billions of dollars with a B back then. We put it in the hands of Americans, said, go buy that house. Go fix up the house you already have. We're going to build all these roads and stuff, which required jobs. You get those jobs. It created a huge amount of wealth in America, except it was only for white people. Those are the types of facts that if we don't fundamentally understand and from our history, you're going to get stuck on, well, you know, financial literacy. People need to learn finances better. They need to learn how to manage their money. Well, manage what money? <laughs> I don't have any, right? Like, you want to teach me how to manage money I don't have? <laughs> or people get stuck on individual behaviors like, well, you know, it's the culture. You know, it, we need to shift their culture. Their culture. And then you have things like culture of poverty. Culture of poverty. What is that about? So these are the types of concepts we come up with when we don't understand why the issue actually exists, because you're not dealing with the root cause. This is why history is so important in our understanding, not just as a society, but even in our organizations and the issues that we're working on with communities. We don't understand why communities are segregated that how, what happened with redlining, and that it just wasn't about redlining, it was restrictive covenants, and it was all types of things that happened that led to the way our communities look today. Why are most public schools in American cities predominantly people of color? There's a whole set of historical stories that explains that. So to wrap up, what I wanted to do was just to share something with you two things with you. This excerpt and then a quote that's been really helpful for me. So this is about critical thinking. Thinking is skilled work. It is not true that we are naturally endowed with the ability to think clearly and logically without learning how or without practicing. People with untrained minds should no more expect to think clearly and logically than people who have never learned and never practiced can expect to find themselves good carpenters golfers, bridge players, or pianists. Yet our world is full of people who apparently do suppose that thinking is entirely unskilled work. That thinking clearly and accurately is so easy and so natural that anybody can think and that any person's thinking is quite as reliable as any other person's. 
So, in our organizations, how do we have some humility, recognize that we're not perfect, we have work to do on all of ourselves, none of us are immune, even us people of color, we got that internalized stuff going on too, which is why diversity is not enough. It's not enough to just pick up pe people of color and sit them at a table and be like, all right, go. Because even people of color have this infection in them too and it will not have the outcomes that you necessarily expect or the perspectives that you necessarily expect. We all need the knowledge, training, and skills to understand the social context, the historical context, to be able to do better and be better. So I'll leave you with a quote and then I'm gonna be quiet because I got the five minute warning like five minutes ago. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with two, actually. So my very favorite quote is, most people don't recognize opportunity because it comes disguised as hard work. And the brilliant place I got that from is a Salada tea bag. <laughs> There's debate over who actually said it, so I just attribute it to the Salada tea bag I got it from. And then the second quote is, if it's not your struggle, it's invisible to you. If it's not your struggle, it's invisible to you. That's the importance of diversity, of strategic diversity, embedded within an equitable situation that allows the pool of knowledge that we're using to make decisions to be deepened by the range of expertise and experience that all of our employees bring to our organizations, and that we have to be honest with ourselves that we don't know everything, we do, we all want to do the right thing and be better and do better, but we actually have to have intentionality in order to get there. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I look forward to speaking with you later. Yeah.